Hello, welcome back. It's another beautiful day here, a prime day for chemistry, honestly. Today we're gonna to be following on once again from another write-up by a guy called Engager who did this publication, well, it's not a real publication, it's a Science Matters publication about tetrazoles. And we'll be following on from our last video in which we made disodium 55 azotetrazole, which is this compound here. What we're making that for is to make this product here, the tetrabrominated isocyanogen, so isocyanogen tetrabromide. We can then replace those four bromine groups with four azide groups, and, and we can make this compound here, isocyanogen tetraazide. Since the write-up by Engager was released, it's now been found out that this compound doesn't actually exist at room temperature. It quickly cyclizes one of those azide groups, reforms a tetrazole ring. You don't have any change in molecular formula, but you just have a bit of a change in structure. So I'm gonna to refer to it as a tetraazide, even though technically it's not a tetraazide because one of the azides is actually a tetrazole group. We want this because it's 89% nitrogen by mass. It has a large reputation. Obviously, I, I get excited by things with a large reputation because even though a lot of people talk about it, no one's actually seen it in a video before. So I think it would be great to make it. Up here is the reaction scheme from Engage's write-up. So we can see that the bromine first breaks a tetrazol group then dibrominates it, that top carbon, and it goes on and you break the other tetrazole group and then you would dibrominate it. So, you know, I could expand this out and the same thing happens on the top and bottom. But it's, it's important to point out that it doesn't happen at the same time. You brominate one end and then you break the other tetrazole and then brominate that. That's important because if we don't fully brominate things, it means that we're gonna end up with this sort of intermediate compound. I can't remember its name off the top of my head. We'll just call it the intermediate compound. And apparently this exists as a bit of a white powder, whereas what we want here, this is a, this is a brown oil. But yes, we have some simple instructions to follow for the bromination of our 5,5 azotetrazole and not a whole lot of detail. So we're kind of gonna be winging a bit of it here. And yeah, I, I haven't written this out fully, but you can imagine you see there's lots of nitrogens here in both tetrazole groups. We only end up with two nitrogens in the final compound. So there, all those nitrogens are released as the gas and the sodium is lost as sodium bromide or it's in solution. So that's really a big driving force for this reaction. The fact that the nitrogen just leaves bubbles out of solution. So it does seem a bit of a shame to make these nice tetrazole groups and then just destroy them in this reaction. But this group here, the C double bond N, single bond N, double bond C, this cyanogen, isocyanogen group is apparently very hard to form and this is one of the few reactions that uh, can form it. All right, so according to our prep, we need eight mole equivalents of bromine. For our 1.1 gram, that means eight mole equivalents is roughly four 0.8 grams of bromine. So it's quite a bit of bromine really. It's just because the molecular weight of bromine is so heavy. Unfortunately, the bit we saved over from our bromine video, which seems like it ages and ages ago, and it's kept pretty well actually in this flask. I didn't think it would, but it has. There's only 2.2 grams in here. That means we're really gonna have to crack an ampule, which is a bit of a shame, but it's kind of what the ampules are there for. So the bromine is in the flask, um, the ampule, uh, you know, I carefully measured out some and then left quite a bit in the ampule and then the wind knocked it over and it spilled over the table. But luckily the table hasn't seemed to stain. I managed to get some sodium carbonate on it pretty quickly. So um, there used to be a big orange stain here, but um, that seems to just be lost to the atmosphere. And then I couldn't reseal the ampule. I did have an attempt with the blowtorch to reseal it, but I couldn't. So I put an extra, probably an extra gram in, of bromine in there. So there's probably about five and a half grams of bromine in there and the ampule is, is lost but that's all right we've used it so at the time i was getting really fucking frustrated but um now i've calmed down a bit i have the bromine there what i'm going to do is i'm going to add some water to this probably about fill it probably probably the flask about half full now we have the bromine happening out there we can turn our attention to our disodium 55 azotetrazole pentahydrate it's underneath some water with these beautiful yellow crystals and we recall that it was a reasonably powerful explosive 
move. So what I'm going to do to get it out of here, rather than scraping at this crystal mass to get it out of the jar, I'm going to fill it full of water, it will all dissolve and then I can just add it as a solution to the bromine water that's out stirring outside. This water is green, I've got to get that one out of the way first. It's, it's green just as a party trick, I just thought it would be cool. So, and, and make it clear what was a condenser water and what wasn't. So you can see a bit of spilt stuff there and that's condenser water. Oh, but it's because I had to change pumps. I thought it was a really great idea putting that pump in the kettle. Alright, that's definitely working. But it really did actually warp the plastic, so um, it's kind of dead. Which is a bit sad, it's been running as a pump for nearly 12 years continuously. Used to run a fish pond pump. Ran all that time um, and just didn't survive being put in the kettle. That's fine, I bought a new pump. Um, it's a little bit more high powered, so it tended to splash the water around a bit, but I've uh, modified it so a bit leaks out, so the water <laughs> runs at a reasonable rate. Things seem to be going okay, a bit of bromine pouring off the top. I don't like shrouding bromine reactions in aluminium foil, because if the bromine splashes onto that, it'll burst into flames. Aluminium bromine have a terribly violent reaction, blah blah blah. But I feel like people in the comments are going to tell me, why didn't you protect it from UV? UV obviously destroys the reaction, so here I am attempting to somewhat protect it from UV. If I remove it so I can film it just a little bit better for a second, it's looking real good. The next step is to heat it actually, so I'm just running it for a little while just so that some of the bromine comes off first because there's a lot of bromine pouring off it and I feel like if I heat it now it's going to be clouds and clouds of bromine but I'm just going to let it react at room temperature. I mean room temperature is about 35, 40 degrees anyway. I mean in the direct sunlight here it's probably getting to 50 degrees anyway with it, no heating whatsoever so that's perfectly fine. Alright 20 minutes in, what we're looking for is a brown oil. And um, I think we're starting to get a little bit of it down the bottom there. Just see that flick around. So, unless that's bromine. So it's cleared up. It used to be all foamy and have a precipitate. So that, that's cleared up. So I might just um, go about heating it a bit more. Hopefully we'll get a bit more oil because there's hardly any of it down the bottom there. But promising signs. Alright, it's had pretty much another hour of sitting in boiling water. And uh, there's really not much more oil separating out. Perhaps we can do an extraction with DCM, but that's going to pull a lot of the bromine out too, which will get a little bit ugly. It's cooled down, and what I'm going to do is we have some oil, so we always really want to quit while we're ahead. I'm just going to try it. I'm going to syringe off that little bit of bottom oil layer, chuck it in the flask, and then um, reheat this up and just really vigorously boil it, because there's still bromine left in solution, obviously, I mean, look at the colour. All right, I had probably an hour of reflux, and now I'm letting it cool down. We have a little bit more oil underneath the stir bar. Hopefully that increases as the whole mix cools down, because it's still quite hot. Also, we have this bit here, which is what we collected earlier. If I can bloody get it out of the thing. Look at that, a single drop of precious oil. So, 
I'm just protecting it from the light because I don't really know how stable it all is. All right, here we are the following morning and we've got some really exciting observations. This first one here is that I cooled this down in the ice bath. We didn't really get much more oil out. You can see that oil down the bottom there. But what's really more important is the fact that we can see some crystalline white solids. If my camera decides to focus enough. Yeah, you can see some stuff getting thrown around in the flask there. It's very subtle, but there's also on the side of this flask here. That really explains our poor yields. It implies it's the intermediate product that still hasn't been brominated fully. And I suppose we just, because we've got to break a tetrazole group really. We've got to break two tetrazole groups really, but breaking that second tetrazole group is actually going to be quite hard, I, I assume. That probably needs a lot of heating. It only really had probably two or three hours, which I thought would be enough, but we've got a lot of stuff to do chemistry wise like there's a lot of atoms to shift around like last time pull out this oil quit while we're ahead and then put this back on the heat um see if we can get even more oil out by breaking everything down that's obviously not that exciting it's kind of bad news in a way because there's more work to be done at least we can get more yield out of it the exciting news is over here if you remember this is the oil that we took out of the flask before and remember it was an oil but now it's not an oil it has decided to crystallize out. Look at that beautiful little bit of solid there. So great. So there's a whole ream of steps about purification in the um, procedure we're following. Steam distillation followed by recrystallization from glacial acetic acid. Neither of which are, are that hard, but it, what makes it difficult is we're dealing on such a small scale here. But the point is, we might just be able to use this solid product, now it's crystallized out into a solid, as is. Um, which is really exciting because it means the next step isn't that hard. It was actually just getting this solid product that was the hard bit. So if we can skip these purification steps and just use the solid as is, maybe we're nearly there. And that's what really excites me. So here it is. It weighs in at a enormous 360 milligrams. We only actually need 100 milligrams for the next step. The one catch, of course, is that it's very brown there is obviously quite a bit of free bromine in it you can see it's staining the paper in some spots so i'm really going to have to clean this up i reckon a very small amount of thiosulfate should neutralize any bromine and leave the tetrabromide untouched i don't think it should really react too much with the um organic bromide and after that final batch of heating what do you know we actually did get some more oil so i think it might have solidified already in there but that's great. <laughs> it makes it really easy. I just pull the stir bar out with a magnet and then I can just scrape the uh, product off the stir bar. Thanks science, very cool. All right, so this is our final yield here. It's 580 milligrams of the isocyanogen tetrabromide, which isn't a high yield. I didn't really cash in one of my high yield coupons for this uh, experiment. We only got 42%. Obviously I've speculated before about lack of bromine and, and the fact that it needs more heat. So perhaps if we heated it for another, you know, couple of hours, we could get another, you know, eke out another 50 milligrams or something like that. But um, I'm pretty happy with this yield. You might ask, why am I not bothering to do any purification techniques? It seems a little slack. Well, I asked myself the question, do we actually need to do this purification, this kind of quite intensive purification in order to get a pure product just if we're turning into the tetraazide product anyway? Like maybe we could just use a crude product and turn it into the tetraazide. And well, I've already taken a small amount out and it works. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him.